Let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll get into our Sunday school lesson for the day. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you that you have given it to us so that we can study it and see what you have uh, said throughout all time and what you're saying to us today. I pray that you would help us to understand what you have said to us in, in Scripture. We can apply it to our lives and that we can go out from here and um, retain this information. Um, so again, thank you. I pray that your spirit would uh, illuminate our, our hearts and our minds to be able to understand and believe these things today. And I pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, several, several weeks ago, uh, Scott Huffman taught in First and Second Samuel. And then for the last uh, month or so, we, we kind of came away from the chronology, the storyline of Scripture. So Solomon got us all the way, or excuse me, uh, Samuel got us all the way to David. Scott took us through there. And then we went through Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. Uh, today we're going to be picking up at the end of Samuel and moving into the next book in the chronology of Scripture, which is First and Second Kings. We, we paused in the wisdom literature because it was very contemporary with David and Solomon, so it made sense thematically to study those things there. But <clears throat> this morning, we're going to return back to the storyline of Scripture. Uh, <clears throat> and I will say up front, we're going to walk through some of the content of the book, but there are 40 different kings and about 400 years of history that are contained in these two books. And so we're not going to do very much of a detailed look at all of the content of each king's reign. Instead, I want to give us all the tools so that we can understand First and Second Kings and read these histories for ourselves. So we'll have kind of three main sections. We're going to cover some of the background of the book. We'll spend a lot of time on the purpose of the book, because that'll help us understand it uh, most well. And then we'll also walk through the content of the book once we're armed with that background and the purpose so that we can understand it a little bit better. So let's start with the background. First and Second Kings were originally one book. It was just the book of kings. There really wasn't two separate documents. It was just all one history. The, the name comes from the first word of the Hebrew text, talking about King David. It's just the kings. And the name also describes the main subject matter of the book. The, the majority of these two books is going through the history of the reigns of the kings of Israel from Solomon uh, all the way until the exile. Uh, by the time of the Greek Septuagint, the translation of the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek, we see that the, the book has been broken into two separate documents. And it's not really based on any thematic change that happens from 1 to 2 Kings or any big event. It's probably more likely that they just couldn't fit it all on one scroll. They wanted to make it more readable, and so they broke it into two separate documents. In, uh, in the Greek, 1 and 2 Kings are actually combined with 1 and 2 Samuel, and you actually have 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th kingdoms. Because these books are really telling the same history. They're telling the history of the kingdom of Israel. 1st and 2nd Samuel start at the end of the Judges, and then it ends with the reign of David. And then 1st Kings records those final days of David and gives the history of the next 400 years. From Solomon, who is at about 960 BC, to the time of the Babylonian exile. And the final event that occurs in the book of Kings is during the exile when King Evil Merodach releases the deposed king of Judah, Jehoiachin, around 561 BC. And we don't know who the author is of the book of Kings. We don't know for sure, but there are some details that can help us draw some conclusions about the author and learn some things. Uh, first, we know based on this last event in the book of Kings that the author couldn't have written it before Jehoiakim was released from prison. So it would have had to have been someone writing after nine, or excuse me, after 561 BC, um, which means the earliest it could have been written is during the exile. That's the earliest it could have been during the exile. Second, because the book ends with them in exile, it doesn't record them coming out of exile, we can presume that they probably, the, the return hadn't happened yet at the time of this writing. So it's very likely that the author was writing this during the exile. And then third, another detail, the author cites several other sources that they pulled from to create this history, to create the history of the kings. They list the book of the Acts of Solomon, the chronicles of the kings of Israel, and the chronicles of the kings of Judah. 
And this tells us that the author had access to document such of these. They weren't just writing this all from memory. They obviously didn't live through all the 400 years. They're pulling from sources. So they had some sort of access to these documents. Uh, Jewish tradition generally ascribes this book to Jeremiah, although I think that's unlikely because he would not have been alive after 561. He wouldn't have made it to Jehoiakim's release. So it, I think it's doubtful that he wrote it. We really don't know who the author is, but we know it's, it's most likely a Jew in the exile um, who knows something about the history and has access to these documents. So that's the background. Now let's discuss the purpose of First and Second Kings, and this is really where we're going to spend the majority of our time this morning. The book of Kings is not purely a historical record. It's not just an attempt to record the details as it happened, uh, you know, pure journalism without any, any input or, or uh, bias, I suppose you could say. Um, in reality, those sources that the author of Kings mentions, those are what is doing that pure historical record, the chronicles of Israel and Judah and Solomon. Those are just reporting the facts. Uh, there, there's also likely a lot more content in each of those sources than we have recorded in Kings. What the author of Kings is doing is taking things from those sources because he's wanting to tell a specific story. He's trying to prove a specific point. And you could look at that cynically as selective journalism, that he's not reporting all the facts, it's not accurate, but that's really not what's happening here. First of all, everything in these books is true. Everything is true. He's not telling us any lies. And it's not like it's failing because it's not recording everything exactly how it happened without any uh, design on it. That's not, what, that's not the point of the book. It's not trying to be that exact uh, statistical representation of just this, these are the facts. Kings is a book that the author wrote to teach the Jewish people something. He's telling them a story based on their history, and he's trying to prove a point. So he's not telling lies, but he's, he's also picking specific details that he wants them to recognize and understand. He is really tracing some specific themes that arise throughout the kingdom of Israel, and these themes are all drawn from one book of the Bible. He, he's, if, you need, if you understand one thing from the book of Kings, understand that it is directly related to the book of Deuteronomy is directly related to the book of Deuteronomy. And so if we want to understand kings, we have to understand Deuteronomy first. Um, if we were going to try to understand kings without Deuteronomy, it would kind of be like watching a March Madness basketball game if you had never heard the story of Cinderella. You'll notice a lot of times during, during March Madness, there's a lot of cliches like, oh, they're going dancing, or it's a Cinderella story, or the, struck, the, the clock struck midnight for this team. And we call it this because there's some similarities between the stories. We call it going dancing because just like these small, low-level teams get to play with really high, powerful teams, but they don't really belong there, it's similar to how Cinderella was drawn up from poverty and got to dance with the royalty at the ball. And then we say the clock struck midnight when these teams lose because that's when Cinderella had to leave the ball. And so if you had never heard the story of Cinderella and you're watching a basketball game where you heard these cliches, you'd be really confused. You would say, why does everyone call this dancing? There, there's very little dancing going on here. Maybe a little bit after the game, but generally there's no dancing. I don't know any player named Cinderella. I don't see that on the back of anyone's jersey. And usually, maybe once in a while, but usually the games don't last till midnight. So I, I don't know what they're saying here. That You would miss, it would just go right over your head what these cliches are. Uh, because you don't have any point of reference. And that is what happens if we read the book of Kings without having the point of reference of Deuteronomy. You'll be able to understand a lot of it, but really the main point of the book will go right over your head. And so in order for us to understand Kings, we have to understand Deuteronomy. So what's the connection? Deuteronomy is Moses' final word to the nation of Israel as they prepared to enter into the promised land. The first generation that received the law in Exodus, they have faded from the scene. They, they sinned, they were rejected, they, they died off in the 40 years in the wilderness, and now a second generation has arisen. And so Moses gives them the law a second time to prepare them to enter the promised land. And it describes in detail how they must live, both individually and as a nation corporately, and it promises them blessing for obedience and cursing 
for disobedience. And this is the Mosaic covenant. This is the conditional covenant that God made with Israel. Uh, Israel didn't find salvation through the Mosaic covenant. People were saved by trusting in God. Following the Mosaic covenant either brought, brought physical blessing if you obeyed, or it brought physical cursing for disobedience. It was conditional. And several specific requirements of this Mosaic Covenant are at the forefront of the book of Kings. You'll notice that he picks up on these specific requirements, that you must do this and this and this to be successful as a nation, and he will come back to them over and over and over. The first of these is the standard for kings themselves. The book of Deuteronomy describes the standard that the kings of Israel must follow. And these standards are found in Deuteronomy 17. And the reason that Deuteronomy, uh, that Moses focuses so much on these is because the king isn't just a political ruler. He's also, in many ways, a spiritual representative for the nation. As the king goes, so goes the nation. He either led the people into obeying God and receiving blessing or disobeying God and receiving cursing. And in Deuteronomy 17, I want to read verses 16 through 20, because they describe uh, several specific character traits to look out for in the king. Moses says, He must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses. Since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return that way again. And he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he acquire for himself excess silver and gold. And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law approved by the Levitical priests. And it shall be with him, and he shall read in it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes and doing them, that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers, and that he may not turn aside from the commandment, either to the right hand or to the left, so that he may continue long in his kingdom, he and his children in Israel. So on the negative side, kings were not to acquire many horses, they were not to acquire many wives, they were not to acquire much excess silver and gold, and they were not to ally themselves with Egypt. On the positive side, they were supposed to write out their own copy of the law, it, essentially to write out their own copy of Deuteronomy, what Moses is saying to them in these books. And so as you read Kings, pay attention for these details, for mentions about gold and silver, about uh, their wives, about Egypt, about their horses, their political power. Pay attention to see if it mentions that they copy out the law. It might seem like minor details, but in reality, these are major keys to understand the success or failure of any given king. For instance, in 1 Kings uh, 10 through 11, we see the high point of Solomon's reign. It's the completion of the temple. There's, there's a grand prayer for God to favor the people and honor his covenants that, that occurs just a couple chapters before. And then chapter 10 concludes this this incredible peak of Solomon's reign by saying how incredible Solomon's wealth was, that he had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horsemen. He had incredible amounts of gold, and he had so much silver that it became worthless in the kingdom. He brought horses from Egypt. He loved over 1,000 wives and concubines. And if you're paying attention, the author just ticked off every red flag in Deuteronomy. He's not just listing random details. He's saying, hey, remember what we learned in Deuteronomy 17? This is a bad sign. In telling the story of the 40 different kings in these books, the author is not just recording history. He's evaluating it. He's saying, here's how this person did in all of these events. These are, you could say that Deuteronomy is, or excuse me, you could say that the kings are evaluative narratives. They're evaluating the reigns of the kings, and by extension, they're evaluating the nation itself by the standard of Deuteronomy. And the standard of the king in Deuteronomy 17 is the first of these major evaluative tools. But another one is the standard of the method and location of worship. The author of Kings is very concerned with how the nation worships and where they worship. In, in Deuteronomy 12, verses 2 through 5, Moses says, You shall surely destroy all the places where the nations whom you shall dispossess served their gods, on the high mountains and on the hills and under every green tree. You shall tear down their altars and dash in pieces their pillars and burn their ashram with fire. 
You shall chop down the carved images of their gods and destroy their name out of that place. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way, but you shall seek the place that the Lord your God will choose out of all your tribes to put his name and make his habitation there. And this place that Moses foreshadowed that God would choose out of all of the people to place his name, that was the temple that Solomon built in 1 Kings 6. This is the place where God demands to be worshipped. And he is the true God, so he has the right to require that worship on his terms. So when Kings mentions that the nation went up to the high places and worshipped in the ways of the nations around them, it's not saying that they're evolved in their worship style. <clears throat> it's not saying that they just modernized in how they worshipped God. What it's saying is that they were fundamentally turning away from right worship, and instead they were committing idolatry and disobeying the commands of Deuteronomy. And it's telling that in the reign of Solomon, which again, directly following the building of this temple where God desired to be worshipped, the author mentions that Solomon turned aside to worship other gods. And as king, this wasn't just a private worship. In reality, he was leading the entire nation into idolatry. And he was endorsing it with his action, but he also encouraged it by building high places, by building false centers of worship for the people to engage in idolatry. And this theme recurs over and over. Jeroboam erects two golden calves in 1 Kings 12. Ahab and Jezebel introduce the worship of Baal and Asherah in 1 Kings 16. And even in the description of many of the good kings who were more like David than anyone else, there's usually a subscript that said, but they did not tear down the high places. And so there is a constant emphasis on right worship and how God demands his worship in the way that he prescribes in his temple, not like the nations, not in idolatry. And so there's a clear standard for the kings in this book. There's a clear standard for the, the place and method of worship throughout kings. But the, the third standard that Deuteronomy brings out is the role of prophets in the life of the nation. Uh, in addition to the 40 different kings, the next most major character in the book of kings is prophets. And prophets were people that are designated by God to speak his word to his people. In Deuteronomy, Moses functioned as a prophet, and in a couple different places, he gave instructions about how the nation was to evaluate and listen to the prophets after him. Uh, first, in chapter 13, there's a litmus test for these prophets. Uh, the litmus test is that they will direct Israel to true worship. And so anyone who's claiming to be a prophet that encourages the nation to engage in idolatry, they were to be rejected and killed. Because that was not a message from God to engage in this idolatry. So that's in Deuteronomy 13. But then in chapter 18 of Deuteronomy, there's another litmus test that Moses gives. He says in verse 22, When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. And so... A key aspect of the prophetic ministry that we see in Kings is that what they say happens. Over and over and over, you will see a prophet make a statement that this will come to pass, and you will see the author makes incredible note that this happened just as the prophet said. That happens repeatedly. And why is that important? Why, why do they keep saying, hey, by the way, this came true? It's because of what the prophets were saying. These are not just men who are making random predictions based on the horoscope or things that come into their head. What the prophet's messages were related to is obeying the law of God. They weren't, there are certain times where they make specific miraculous predictions, but in general, their message is that they need, the people need to listen to the word of God because it has promised consequences for their action. It has promised that they will experience the curses of the law if they disobey the law. And what we see is that happens because God keeps his word. And the prophets are a function of that because they are giving God's word to his people. Uh, so there are many prophets that are mentioned in the book of Kings. There are a lot that are unnamed. There are many that are part of a group called the sons of the prophets. There, there's some lesser known ones like Ahijah and Jehu and Micaiah. And there's also ones that are more familiar to us, like the prophet Jonah is mentioned. And the prophet Isaiah occurs in the book of the Kings. 
And in fact, the time frame for kings, this almost 400 years, it actually serves as the backdrop for almost all of the prophets who have books that bear their name in Scripture. Everyone except for Daniel and Ezekiel, who wrote during the exile, and Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, who wrote after the exile. Those are the only ones that don't, their ministries don't occur during the kings. And so while all of their names aren't mentioned in this history, we can also presume that the messages of of their books that are preserved for us would have been well known to the nation as well at that time. And yet, sadly, the nation rejected them. Now, two prophets do stand out more than most of the others, and that is Elijah and Elisha. And these are most likely, or excuse me, these are more well known to us than even the kings whose reign that they spanned. We maybe know Ahab, but it would, we'd be hard-pressed to list like the eight or ten other kings that occurred during either of their reigns because they were the prominent character in the story that the author of Kings was trying to, set, to tell. And they had an outsized role in both the miracles they performed and the message that they were proclaiming to the nation. They had a powerful ministry of calling the nation to true worship. And this, again, draws to mind what Moses tells us in Deuteronomy 18. In addition to what I read before, Moses also promised that God would raise up a prophet like himself to direct the people to obedience. And he says in verses 18 and 19 of Deuteronomy 18, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. And he goes on to say that those who do not heed the words of this prophet will even be put to death. And in many ways... Elijah and Elisha lived up to the standard of this prophet like Moses. When people disregarded their message, they died. In 1 Kings 18, we see 450 priests of Baal who die when God comes to Elijah's aid in this battle showdown between Elijah and the prophets. And we find stories of people dying because of their disregard for the words of Elisha in 2 Kings 2 and 3 and 6 and 9 and over and over and over. These people who don't listen to his words are put to death. But this promise of a prophet like Moses created an expectation that there would be a great, even messianic prophet that actually exceeds even Elijah and Elisha. In many ways, they they fulfilled that role more than anyone else had come before, especially Elijah. And throughout the Old and New Testaments, Moses and Elijah start to become mentioned together because of their prophetic ministry. But it's Jesus himself who most truly fills this role of the prophet like Moses from Deuteronomy. And I talked with JD. He's not going to get to it today. But it just so happens that our series in Luke lines up with this. And he may have something to say about it today and and next week to kind of further explain how Jesus fits. Um, That's a little bit beyond where we can go in Kings. But for our purposes, it's important to know that prophets serve a significant role in, in the book of Kings in preaching the word, and they served as a reminder to the nation that there was a great prophet who had been promised to them who was still to come. So Deuteronomy is really the key to understanding the book of Kings. Uh, Deuteronomy tells us how kings must behave, how the nation must worship, and it tells us how the nation must respond to God's prophets. And so the question is, why did the author focus on these things? And it's because when he wrote the book to the people, they were in exile. The book of Kings contains some positive stories, but as a whole, it's a massive downward trajectory that shows failure after failure. The people ignored the law of Deuteronomy again and again and again. And as such, they earned the judgment of exile, which was promised in Deuteronomy 28. And so now, to this nation in exile, the author gives them this book of the kings to show them how they got here and to implore them to repent. He's saying, don't keep making the same mistakes that all of your forefathers did. That's how you ended up here. Instead, you need to listen to the word of God and turn back to him. The nation in exile is facing the same choices that their forefathers did. Will their leaders rule justly? Will the people worship rightly? Will they listen to the prophets? And the generation that went into exile is growing older and will soon be replaced by a generation that didn't experience the fall of their nation. They had never known what it was like being in the land. And so just like Deuteronomy gave the second generation of Israelites in the wilderness a stark warning to obey, 
Kings gives this second generation in exile a stern reminder to repent and obey as well. And so this is the message of the kings. Turn to God and obey. You saw what happened when your forefathers disobeyed, so don't be like them. Obey the commands of Deuteronomy and turn away from your false worship. Listen to the true words of God proclaimed through the law and through the prophets and trust in God, not in riches, not in human power, not in any pleasure you can find. Turn back to God. And once again, this shows a direct connection to Deuteronomy. Listen to the words of of Deuteronomy 30, verses 1 through 4. When all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you, and you return to the Lord your God, you and your children, and obey his voice and all that I command you today with all your heart and with all your soul, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have mercy on you, and he will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. And what Moses is saying is that when you go into exile because of your sin, if you turn back to God, he will restore you. That's what the author of Kings is trying to tell them as well. He's saying, look how we got here. You sinned your way into exile. What do you do now? Turn back to God. Repent and he will restore you. God has been faithful to keep his word of cursing. And he will be faithful to keep his word of blessing as well. So that is the message of Kings. Uh, Deuteronomy and the Mosaic Covenant is square at the heart of this book. Um, But there is one other covenant that, as the whole trajectory of the book goes, you can see it in the background as well. And this is the Davidic covenant. And this Davidic covenant is an unconditional promise that God gave to David in 2 Samuel 7. He says, When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. And so the Davidic covenant is an unconditional covenant with David and his descendants. God promised to establish the line of David to reign as kings forever. God does mention that if any descendants commit iniquity, God would discipline that person. But even their sin could not revoke God's unconditional promise to preserve the Davidic line of kings. His throne shall be established forever. And so while the Mosaic covenant was conditional, it was dependent on if the nation obeyed, the Davidic covenant was unconditional. The only thing it was dependent on was God's faithfulness. And this serves as the background explanation for how the history of Israel unfolds. God disciplines the nation when they disobey, even sending them into exile. But no matter how far they fall, he will not break his promise to preserve the line of David. So that is the background and the purpose of Kings. It's written in the exile to call the nation to trust God and turn from their sin. It's an evaluative history of the nation that shows where they went wrong and then presents the same choice to the current generation. Trust God and live, turn to idols, and perish. And with our remaining time, we have 16 minutes, so I think we're doing okay, I'd like to walk briefly through the content of Kings and kind of highlight some of these elements that we've drawn out already. So, 1 Kings begins with the transition of power from David to Solomon. And the Mosaic and Davidic covenants are squarely in the foreground, kind of begging the question, is God going to honor his covenant with David? Will Solomon meet the Deuteronomic standard for kings? And the early returns are good. Solomon gains firm control of the kingdom. He has political and military success. He's very wise in his actions. And he's even blessed by God with unsurpassed wisdom, more than any other person has ever had. And then he builds the temple. The temple that God had promised that David's son would build, and the the temple that he's promised back in Deuteronomy that he would give them, Solomon builds this temple. And in chapter 8, we find a grand dedication, a prayer to God. And, And the words of Solomon are drawn almost directly from Deuteronomy. It shows that he's been doing his homework, and he knows what God has said to them in the past. 
By 1 Kings 10, we see the nation of Israel at their pinnacle. Uh, The promises to Abraham that God gave that his descendants um, would be blessed by the nation, they would have a land to dwell in, they would have numerous offspring, they all look like they're being fulfilled. They're well on their way, more than at any time in the past in their history. Their, Their land borders weren't quite what God had promised to Abram in Genesis 13, but they're getting there. They're close. The nations are coming to Israel to bless them, just like God said. And the nation is prospering and flourishing. So it seems like the nation is well on their way. But then it all goes wrong. And rather than the reign of Solomon being the starting point of the grand trajectory of the kingdom, it's rather, rather the high point. And it all goes downhill from there. As we mentioned before, Solomon is drawn astray with wealth, with power, with lust, And as a result, God says to him in 1 Kings 11, Since this has been your practice, and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes that I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. Yet for the sake of David, your father, I will not do it in your days, but I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away all the kingdom, but I will give give one tribe to your son. For the sake of David, my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem that I have chosen. And you can hear the Mosaic and Davidic covenants working in tandem. God disciplines Solomon by tearing away the majority of the kingdom. But for the sake of David, it is not taken away completely, and it is not even in his lifetime. And so in chapter 12, we see the nation divided. The ten northernmost tribes keep the name of Israel, while Judah and Benjamin in the south uh, become simply known as the larger of those two tribes, Judah. And up until this point in the story, when you hear the word Israel, it refers to the whole nation, the 12 tribes of Israel. When you hear Judah, it refers refers to the one tribe. From 1 Kings 12 on, Israel means the northern tribes of Israel, and Judah means the southern tribes. There's a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. And there's a little bit different meaning that's taken on by those two words. And because there's now two different kingdoms with stories to tell, the author switches back and forth from nation to nation. He'll tell the story of a king of Judah. And then when that king dies, he'll tell the story of the contemporary king of Israel. So he's not just telling all of Israel and all of Judah. He's going back and forth. And sometimes it takes more than one reign in a certain kingdom to get to the point where the contemporary king has died. So it could be two or three kings of Israel before you get back to Judah. And really to understand what you're reading, it requires a little bit of close attention to the description given to each king at the beginning of their reign. And we're helped by this because as the author evaluates each king, he gives a very similar uh, description. There, there's a pattern he goes through of certain details. He begins with the date they started reigning, which is cross-referenced with the king of the other nation. So for example, In the seventh year of the reign of Jehu, king of Israel, Jehoash began to reign in Judah. So he gives a cross-reference to where it is in the reign of the other kingdom. Then after the date, there is a comparison with another king from the history of Israel. It's usually David, if they want to signify this was a good king, or someone like Ahab or Jeroboam, if they want to signify it was a bad king. The author then highlights the major events of this king's reign, and that could take anywhere from a few verses to several chapters, and then concludes with their death. And so as you look through these details, pay extra attention to the person the king is compared to, whether good or bad, as well as the amount of space that's dedicated to their reign. Even if a king reigned for many years, they may have a short amount of material that's actually recorded in kings, which tells us they aren't actually as important to the nation as some of the kings that have a lot of space given to them. So we can learn a lot about these kings based on how the author describes them. Now, the first king of the northern tribes of Israel, named Jeroboam, instantly leads the nation into idolatry. There's a brief moment where you think, oh, there's a new kingdom. Perhaps he, unlike Solomon, will lead the nation into worship. But instead, he leads them into false worship, not right worship. He establishes two golden calves reminiscent of the Exodus. And he establishes them as places of false worship. In addition to these high places, uh, he establishes them as places of worship. And then in chapter 14, the prophet Ahijah proclaims that because of his sin, the house of Jeroboam would come to an end. 
And this occurs in the next chapter as a military general kills Jeroboam's son in a coup. This happened repeatedly in Israel. There's very little consistency in the northern kingdom of Israel. There's incredible turmoil. There's many coups. Over the course of 20 different kings and about 200 years, there are five different dynasties. You know, they may not last very long. But five different ruling families in Israel. Meanwhile, in Judah, the same amount of kings, and in even longer time, about 350 years, there's one dynasty, the house of David. They are very different in who reigns each kingdom. The, lines, uh, the kings of Judah are not much better spiritually than the kings of Israel, but there is one major difference between the two kings, and that is the Davidic covenant. God has promised to preserve the line of David. And so you'll consistently see the note, Nevertheless, for David's sake, the Lord preserved him. 1 Kings 16 through 22 highlight the rise of sinful worship in Israel, in the northern kingdom. Most of the action focuses on the relationship of a particularly sinful king, King Ahab, and a particularly powerful prophet, Elijah. And amazingly enough, even though Kings presents Ahab as one of the most wicked kings in the history of Israel, in 1 Kings 21, this evil king repents. And I think the author is highlighting this because that's the point of the book. He's saying that if Ahab, wicked King Ahab, who's one of the greatest villains in our history, if he, when he was rebuked for his sin, repented and turned back to God, then you, reader in the exile, have not fallen too far. You as well should turn back to God and repent and find blessing. Second Kings begins by recording a transition of power. But this time, it's not a transition from one king to another. It's actually a transition from Elijah to Elisha. And while First Kings ends with the ministry of Elijah mainly in focus, Second Kings begins with the ministry of Elisha. That's the first nine chapters of Second Kings that's in focus. Then as Elisha fades off the scene, chapters 10 through 17 of Second Kings focus mainly on the final kings of the northern tribe of Israel. God consistently interceded through prophets, through minor judgments, to try to get their attention, to call them back to repent. But finally, in chapter 17 of 2 Kings, we see the end of the northern kingdom. This occurs in 722 B.C. And the end is recorded quite, quite ignominiously in one verse. In the ninth year, this is 2 Kings 17.6, In the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria, and he carried the Israelites away to Assyria and placed them in Halah and on the Habor, the river of Gozan, and in the city of the Medes. And that's it. The author gives this one verse to the demise of the entire northern kingdom of Israel. But he then takes the entire rest of the chapter of 1 Kings 7, or 2 Kings 17 to do a post-mortem. He's less concerned with the event that happened and more concerned with telling them why. And in excruciating detail, he goes through the history of the kingdom and compares it with where they fell short of Deuteronomy. He compares it and shows the Mosaic Covenant. He overviews their sin, their idolatry, their disobedience, and he reminds them of the commands and the promises of Deuteronomy that they neglected. And his point is that they brought this judgment upon themselves, and that is why they went into exile. Then chapters 18 through 25 of 2 Kings focus on the remaining nation, the southern kingdom of Judah. And some of the greatest kings of Judah, Hezekiah and Josiah, who were both described as following after David in more than any other king had ever done, uh, these two kings reigned during this time, during these last uh, seven or eight chapters of 2 Kings. But even their reigns as pinnacles, as examples of how kings should reign in so many ways, even their reigns were not enough to bring the nation to repentance. While God had preserved the line of David throughout all of this history, even miraculously at times, I, one of the stories I wish I could have told was how Athaliah and, uh, came to power. You'll have to go read that. Please read that. Um, one of my favorite stories of how God used the Davidic covenant. Even though God preserved the line of David throughout this history in so many ways, the nation of Judah was spiritually not much better than the northern kingdom of Israel. And this is epitomized in an incredible way in 2 Kings 22. In this chapter, Hilkiah, the high priest, comes to King Josiah and he tells him that they found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. 
And what this means is they had literally lost the law. They didn't have the law. The law that they were supposed to be following, that the king was supposed to be copying down when he came to power, the law that was the rules for the entire nation, they just lost it. And do you know what this book of the law most likely was? Deuteronomy. This is what the author of Kings is doing. He's pointing out how they've gotten here. And by the way, when King Josiah reads the law, he responds appropriately. He tears his clothes. He turns to God. He, he even initiates incredible reforms in the nation to spiritually reform it. And it says that it's greater than anything that's happened before. But while God welcomed his response of faith and repentance, even that was not enough to preserve the nation. God deferred his judgment until after Josiah's death, but it would still come. And 2 Kings 24 and 25 tell the story of the fall of Judah. And these final days of Judah are reminiscent of the final days of Israel. Uh, their king Jehoiakim, the last king in the line of David, is deported to Babylon. And a string of non-Davidic puppet kings reign in Judah. But because of the Davidic covenant, this should lead us, leave us with a question. What about the promise that someone would reign on the throne forever? How can God keep his word when the Davidic line has come to an end? And we see in the last four verses, the conclusion to the book of Kings, which comes seemingly out of nowhere with the trajectory that he's been building in Judah. The last four verses tell us that King Jehoiakim, the last of the line of David, miraculously finds favor with King Evil Merodach, king of Babylon. And not only is his life preserved, but he finds blessing. He's elevated out of his place in prison. And this shows the masterful way the author has crafted this book. Not only has he clearly demonstrated that the people must repent, he has also shown that God has been faithful to his covenant to preserve the line of David. He reminds the people that God will still fulfill this promise which we know he has ultimately done in sending the true heir to David's throne, Jesus Christ. And in fact, this deposed king, Jehoiakim, who's elevated in exile, he shows up in the lineage of Jesus under his other name, Jeconiah, in Matthew 1.12, which further underscores God's faithfulness. And that is the book of Kings. It's a historical commentary that evaluates the kingdoms of Israel and Judah according to the standard of Deuteronomy. And it calls the nation in exile to repent. As we read this book, we can apply the same truths that are given to the original audience. We should recognize how serious God is about obeying his word. We should listen to the preaching of his word from the prophets of scripture and from the preachers and teachers he gives us today. We as well should turn away from our sin and trust in God alone, refusing to worship sinful idols. And we should recognize the underlying faithfulness of God to keep his promises. Let us heed the call of First and Second Kings and turn to God in faith and repentance. And that is it. You are dismissed.